Yes, I think, did you come into the Daily Show one day? Like, and a couple of times, you, like, yeah. you like hung out for, yeah. Um, I think so I share an office with Joe Opio. And oh, so, yes! Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I feel like you were most likely probably hanging out for a good amount of the day in our office. So, yeah, um, yeah no, definitely, yeah. So it's uh, good to see you. Nice seeing you again. Yeah. Are you in, physically in South Africa right now? 100%. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All of, all of me is here now. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Bill, I've, I actually had a question for you. So kind of on the point of, you know, with the small ceiling and the, the whole setting and everything, do you think that a comic needs to be in an environment to be able to perform like that type of an environment to be able to be funny? Or do you think that it kind of shows that you're a good comic if you could just go out onto like, uh, I don't know, like Central Park or whatever, and then just say like a joke. And if people don't necessarily laugh, does that mean that you're like a bad comic? So do you think that, my, my question is, do you think that setting plays a fundamental factor in the whole, uh, you know, thing? <laughs> I think that there's a range. There's a range. And if you go to the, too, too far to the extremes, mm -hmm. um, but for instance, I, I'm sure you, you guys have experienced this where you don't always get, your perfect environment. You don't get, you know, the comedy seller kind of environment. You, you've got to, listen, when I, was a, when I was a comic, and I was, despite what audiences may tell you, <laughs> um, sometimes you've got to do a noon show in the lunchroom at the community college, and people are eating lunch, and it's your job to get them to the extent possible. Yeah. Having said that, there are some guys like back in the day, there were, there were these guys, I talk about two guys. One is Charlie Barnett. He was a, a legend back in New York. He used to work Washington Square Park. He worked outside. And uh, he would, yeah, and he would get 200 people around and he would work and he would make a good living passing the hat after and during every show. And I would, ask, I would come out there and I would beg him to come in, inside in the, in the comedy cell. And he would refuse and refuse. And finally, he said, okay. And it wasn't great. It wasn't great. It was, it, isn't that really interesting? Yeah. Rick Avilas was another guy who's a, a, a Hispanic comic who left us during the 80s. Um, he was a guy who could work both outside and inside. But if you go to the extremes, then I, I don't think it's fair to say, well, you're not a great comic if you can't work Washington Square Park. Um, but yeah, I think and any professional, no matter what you do, you know, Kat, you're, you're a writer. Um, so it's, I don't know what your hours are, but back when I was say, when I'm writing on a television show, you don't write because you're in the mood, you write because it's nine o'clock yeah. And they need the page. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's not okay. That's yeah. right. You got to go ahead. Be a genius right now. Especially about terrible, horrible things happening. <laughs> yeah, especially. Yeah. yeah. Especially. You, go ahead. I want to say the outdoor shows. It's I'm I'm still like in Manhattan, and there's been shows popping up outdoors, like in Central Park and in Brooklyn, and I haven't done one yet i've just kind of been seeing on social media like oh okay they're becoming more of a thing i should probably start doing them at least while the weather's still good but it's mm. interesting because some of the ones that are in central park like there is no mic it is just you projecting and it's people spread out even more than they normally would be outside because of social distancing mm. um but from what i've heard like they are fun and going well, but it is, it makes me a little nervous too, because I've gotten so used to the safety of like the indoor close quarters, low yeah. ceilings, kind of knowing, yeah. having the comfort that at least the setting is going to be what you need it to be. And so then take that extra risk of putting it in a less ideal setting. Um, but back in LA, there were outdoor shows fairly often, like on rooftops or like in garages, because the weather was always nice. It was kind of part of the indie culture so they're definitely possible like you can have really good outdoor shows yeah depending on the environment people are in the mindset and ready to to laugh yeah in, uh, intention is everything yeah intention is everything when, when the audience is determined to laugh and you are determined to make them laugh 
it's a winning combination. And I often find that you find a comic with such great potential, but it almost feels like they are unwilling to put themselves out there and the audience picks that up. You know, because there's, there's two different levels of insecurities I found with comedy. You can either have the extreme of it when you are super famous, or you can have the extreme of it when you are known, when you think you're not going to get the laughs because no one knows you, or when you're super famous and you go, but I don't have to do this. Those are the two extremities that audiences pick up on very, very quickly. And when you start making it about them instead of you, you've already lost them because you are not offering yourself up. You're already up on stage. And I always say to my friends, comedy is the one thing that you buy without knowing what you're buying. In music, people know what they're getting. Yeah. If John Mayer advertises a show, they know what he's getting. But if, if Kat does a show, they don't know what you're going to say on the night. They know you might be funny. That's the only guarantee they have. The right. fact that you might be funny. So even on their certainty, they're trading on ambiguity. Yeah. So if you come there and already insecure, you're already telling them that the one little voice in their head that said this is a bad idea, which is often the other person that they dragged along with, is probably right. But I find that it happens in such a split second that you lose it quickly. So I find that comics who suffer from that should always have an MC or a great opening act to kind of ease people in and let them know that it's not like that. If I come off like that in the first five minutes of me as the main act being there, that was not my intention. You know, someone to kind of pre-apologize for you and then set the audience up. And I find that the more famous people get, the less people they put on or they put too many people on before them. And that can also have a reverse effect on it. But I find that it's, it's the willingness. It's, it's the willingness. It's the... Do you want to make a connection with a bartender when you sit in a bar so that he gives you drinks and when you, you nod, he knows that you're, you want another one, you know, and we, we often become too lazy and too detached from that human connection as, as, as people. And then it shows up in stand-up comedy, you know, we, we, comics that are not distracted on their phones connect better with audiences because they're not anywhere else but in the room. Yeah, that's so true. No? Yeah, um, you know, I used to tell comics back in the day when comics would listen to me, because now not. But <laughs> I used to tell comics the the audience the audience is like a baby, and it needs to be held securely. Yeah. And they are judging you not when you start talking; they are mm -hmm. judging you as you're walking to the stage. The mm -hmm. first instant that they see you, mm -hmm. they are judging you. So if you walk up like you're supposed to be there, that's already starting to build the, the positive spiral as opposed yeah. to now you're digging yourself a hole. Because when, you're, on, when yeah. you're doing up, you're either building or you're digging yourself a hole. That's a good one. That's a good one. So I, that's, that, I, I used to tell people that. And, and, and the, what you're saying, the intentionality, you know, Bill Maher, who – We'll talk about him another time. But from day one, Bill used to show up in a blazer and uh, uh, ready to host The Tonight Show. Yeah. He was 23, ready to host The Tonight Show and would approach every show as if the producer of The Tonight Show was in the audience. It could be mm -hmm. six people drunk, but mm -hmm. he was going to do his thing. Mm -hmm. And and like a professional. And that's the kind of dedication I think that you need. Yeah, the yeah. audience needs to feel confident that you feel confident. They, they want to feel secure that you have control and it's not going to be up to them to have to do anything extra. Yes. Like, yes. take care of you. <laughs> You're supposed to yes. be the one taking care of them, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would tell comics, I would say, look, because sometimes they would comics have this tendency sometimes some of them and i'd say they have met you way more than halfway they have you know come down they've got a babysitter they parked the car yeah. they bought drinks mm -hmm. they i mean come on you, you know out a bucks. yeah i'd say I'm, I'm not telling you you have to kill and do your a material every time because this is sort of like a gym to work stuff out yes. but yes with the intentionality that you were talking about, Eugene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess when you let go of the fear, you become okay. But oh, say that again. Easier said than done. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's worth, that's worth repeating both in terms of stand-up and in terms of life. Say, say it again. 
Yeah, when you let go of the fear, you're good. You're golden. Because it, it, it holds you back. I, I, I think... Put that on a pillow. <laughs> <laughs> when you, yeah, hang it on, hang I, it on my I, bedroom I, ceiling. I read somewhere that when, when you're fearful, you're just echoing what everyone else who's negative uh, says about you and they haven't said it yet. So you play out millions of scenarios and then fear gets a reason to be around because ultimately it was just a bad idea that you've just cultivated and you thought, what if they think, what if they think, what if they think, what if they think. And we, we take for granted that when we're on a stage, we are untouchable. You know, we, we're closest to Hercules when we're there. We're we are, we are demigods. We're half human, half gods. Because the human part in us is the fact that they know we're there physically. But the God part is the part that they don't know what we're going to say next. But we take that so for granted, you know, the halo is on you, it's a spotlight, you're already elevated, you're on a stage and you can say whatever you want to say. And we take that process for granted. And I think it's one thing I never want to lose every time I do stand up. And I've turned down gigs sometimes because I felt like I wasn't feeling it. I didn't want to take it for granted. I, I could see the stage, but I couldn't see myself as how I should see myself. The Herculean effect was not there yet, you know, and that's when you should learn to walk away and know when to come back. But sometimes I go home and I kick myself in the butt and I think I should have taken this part because I would have had nice pictures. But <laughs> Well, not to, not to play with your head, but like, what's a, what's an example of of a, a a stage that you were offered that you you didn't take? Oh, it was it was there's a there's a big show in South Africa that happens, uh, huge thousands of people, and I did it once, and I did it the second time, but the third time I just knew it wasn't for me anymore. You know, I just I could just feel it. I I, I felt that I was going to take the audience for granted. I just knew it. I knew that I was going to get there and I knew what to say. And I, and I said to Josh the other time, like the reason why, and the stuff that you see on the internet from me is from almost 10 years ago. I haven't put anything out ever since, you know? And cause I felt like whenever I feel on edge on stage, whenever I feel like the surprise is for both of us, that's when I feel like I'm doing stand up. you know, other than that, it just feels like a scam. And I know that you can repeat material. I'm not against that. I repeat material all the time. What I'm saying is, I want it to feel new to me. So when I knew that the laughs were there, when I knew that they knew who I was and I knew what I was going to say and I had eight minutes or 10 minutes to say it, I didn't feel worthy of the stage. And I, could, I felt like someone else could use the stage better than me, you know? And I, 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 as, I, as I watched the show, I thought to myself, I should have been up there. But I knew, I, I knew I didn't feel it. You know, I, I knew. It's like when I walk into the Daily Show and I see the writers, and I see the work that you guys put in and I go, I can write, but I'm like, I'm nowhere near where you go. I haven't even, I haven't earned the right to call myself what you guys call yourselves because you've put in the hours. And it's only when you know it inside of you, then you can become it, you know, and the fear and insecurity plays no factor, you know. You can be complacent, which is normal because you're human, but you'll never have fear of walking in that office like you do every day and opening your laptop and nine o'clock you have to start becoming a writer. The fear will never exist because you know you you're doing what you're supposed to do. Now that's I feel like you're giving us more credit than <laughs> we, we deserve for that. But, um, that's no, I mean, yeah. but yeah, I think you're right. But I feel like even though there's I guys I feel like I still have a little bit of fear, like maybe a healthy amount of fear, yeah. in, like in everything I do. To because I think that just also means like you care, like you yeah, you, you yeah. want what you do to be good right. and you want people to react the way you want to react, whether it's writing or a live show. But, um, but yeah, I think the confidence knowing you can do it, but that healthy dose of fear that I still want this. Yeah. I want to get this right. You know? Yeah. And I think in, in, in general, not to get too, uh, to Tony Robbinsy uh, about it, <laughs> But when you and I'm, I'm putting my hands in the frame because I'm a Jew. So if, if I don't, <laughs> in the frame, then half of what I mean is is lost. Um, but when when you're you're living on the edge between your comfort zone and the unknown, yeah. that's when interesting things. That's when growth kind of happens. Yeah, I've, I've that's a great idea to talk about. Yeah, I've, I've tried to make myself do more crowd work. Like since I moved to New York, 
there was way more opportunities, I feel like, to do crowd work in the clubs in New York versus LA because the audience is just mm -hmm. very different. So I've been really like challenging myself to do that. And I've been noticing over, I've been here three years now in New York and I have been slowly getting better at crowd work, but it's very scary because that leads you into an unknown territory of, yeah. okay, these aren't my prepared jokes that I know yeah. are tried and true. I don't know what this guy's going to say and how well it's going to go, but it's something mm -hmm. I've been forcing myself to do and I have noticed I've been getting better and now feel more confident and like in charge when I am able to do it. And I now I feel more confident. I don't know. If, I may have lost it since we haven't been in a club in five months. So hopefully like those skills aren't diminishing. But, uh, but it's funny because I said to my husband, I was like, man, I was just getting really good at crowd work and then the clubs closed. But I feel like that's a, that kind of puts the fear and the unknown and the confidence yeah. kind of all into one mixture because yeah. that's like a whole different element of stand-up yeah. too, like from prepared jokes. I think stand-up is going to be interesting after lockdown though. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be what, what do you What do you think, when you say interesting, interesting is an interesting word. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think from the point of view that we're going to hear from comics, um, from comedians um, that are going to sprout up because of lockdown itself, um, from comedians who are not who are huge and not going to have such a huge following, because we also take for granted that um, lockdown made fans want to interact with comics more, and then that was social media, and then they get they they got to know comics more, and sometimes when they got to know you, they stopped liking you. There are those <laughs> comics where where it almost feels like they opened that personal door, of putting that camera in their house to do, you know, interaction with their fans and the fans actually went, mm, without the glossiness of a big stage or a TV show, I, actually you as a person, I, I'm not for you, but I'll go for someone else now. And I think that's where the interesting dynamic is going to come from. We're going to see people that have watched stand up for the first time on television, on Netflix, coming to watch it on stage. Mm. And they would have never picked a favorite. They would have just said to themselves, I love stand up. What does stand up have to offer? You know, that, that's who the diehard fan is going to have to fight for tickets now and for a seat at the comedy club. And as comics, we're going to have to work harder because we're going to have to get over the fact that they know who I am. And the ones who are new are going to have to get over the fact that you've been here longer so they know you better. So that audience is going to be very sophisticated after lockdown. Eh? It's going to be very sophisticated. Very, very sophisticated. And I'm hoping also eager that they are, they just are going to be ha like happy to be out of the house and out in the world. And so they may like show up and be like, hey, I don't know this comic, but I'm just willing yeah. to give it a chance because it's a night out and I'm not with my kids anymore. So I'm hoping there will be like an eagerness and maybe like more of like that intention like you were talking about, like the audiences will be very intent on laughing and having a good time. Yes. Because it'll be freedom for them. But you yeah. know, at the risk of sounding like a club owner, um, <laughs> I understand <laughs> that you're saying they're going to be more sophisticated and you're saying that they're going to be more eager i just want them to be there i just <laughs> I don't be there i don't care what they do i don't care if they're eager they're sophisticated they're dopes they don't give a shit i don't care as long as they're in their seats and they pay the check i don't care <laughs> yeah i said it i said it Tell everybody. Totally valid. <laughs> Tell everybody the, the, the facade has been dropped. He doesn't care. <laughs> but do you do you think that people are actually like hungry for laughs right now? Or do you think it's going to be a thing of like everyone comes out of this lockdown period and it's going to be like, oh, no, you know, just everyone's like depressed and stuff. Or what do you think the situation is going to be like? It's going to be like how it was when every great disaster, after every great disaster, you know, when you, when World War II finished, people got a better appreciation for home and crafts and going out hunting and fixing up their cars and starting up a project and getting a 42 Ford, you know, to fix it in their garage. All of a sudden, we're going to appreciate the things we never cared about and we are not going to want to waste anymore. Because you see, COVID never gave us a warning sign. There was no pre-COVID uh, you know, we never got enough of a lead on time to kind of hunker down and prepare ourselves mentally that this is coming. It was not like any other great disasters like a war that we faced before as a, as a human species. So this one came as a surprise. What this taught us was independent thinking and always living for the moment. As, 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 as airy-fairy as it sounds, this is what it was. 
-hmm. It just taught us that, that this is what matters now and go out there and just live your life. But I think right now we're going we're gonna to come out of this differently, all of us. We're gonna want, we're gonna want to experience life now more. You know, people are going to decide what they like and what they don't like. And this is, was enough time for people to come to that conclusion and not be swayed anymore, you know? And hopefully, I mean, the hard reality too is people who did suffer economically, they may not have the extra money to have those nights out that they so desperately need and want. So um, hopefully that's not going to be a series. Like hopefully the recovery economically will happen as well. Because I will totally understand people listening to this are going to be like, yeah, I'd love to go to a club, but I don't have any money to pay my rent right now. So that could also be a very hard, yeah. real obstacle in, the, in like in the way of, like it, was a, it was an interesting thing I heard. I was listening to a video by uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer. I'm a big fan in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> and then he was saying that you sometimes you mustn't use, you can't use your old mind to solve new problems. Mm. And, and right now, as a people, that's what we're doing. We're thinking of preserving jobs. I used to have this conversation with my friends. I said, in the first few months of the lockdown, why are we worried about, we're, our minds are still in the past. We're still thinking what it feels like to be in that office and to be called for that job or to get that salary and to go to the supermarket, to go to the club or the restaurants. We're still there. Our minds have not acclimatized to where we find ourselves and to where we're going. Fixating about going to that restaurant, the restaurant might not be there. You might not be there, let alone the means to be there, you know? Yeah, so yeah. We, we, we skip so many parts to include ourselves. And I guess it's a human nature thing to want to feel all important is we skip so many parts. We skip the fact that the restaurant owner might shut down or, or, the, or the restaurant might just not be there anymore. It might not have interest in it. You might want to run a Brazilian piano bar now instead of a restaurant. <laughs> and, and all of these things in between that can happen before it impacts you going there once a month. Do you understand? So, so this pandemic just gave us a broader view and also not to think of ourselves and the things that we miss, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think also it, it, it may change from country to country or from culture to culture. 100%. Um, I think that uh, countries that are showing a, a proclivity to already behave in concert with each other mm -hmm. and to cooperate yeah. for the greater good, they're already showing that inclination as opposed to certain countries that I don't want to mention because why drag America into this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that we may, after COVID is quote over, we may go being right back to being the arrogant, self-absorbed a-holes that we've been. Uh, I, I, I wish I was more optimistic about this country. Yeah, I feel yeah. like that is Hopefully that is what happens, but I, I feel like, yeah, after things like, you know, 9-11, everyone was all nice and got along, looked out for each other for like a month or two, but, you know, within the next year, everyone was back to their old ways of really? dating, and I know, humans are assholes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just the way New Yorkers say I love you, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey. And first time I get flicked off after this, and be like, oh, I got flicked off today. That feels so good. <laughs> well, that's human interaction, you know. Yeah. You know. When, I first, when, I, when I first came to New York, I kept, on, I kept on wanting that to happen to me. No one, no one was rude to me. <laughs> really? People that happened to me my first time ever in New York. I remember somebody was carrying a suitcase. They ran over, like, my foot, and they told me to go F myself. And I was like, oh, oh wow, I'm, I'm in New York right now. I was like, no apology. You ran over my foot. Like, what is this? <laughs> Not, every time I'm there, I feel like I should ask for my money back. Nothing happens. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. You didn't no even guess that. I'm walking here. Like, that sort of a no, thing. <laughs> the only thing I've noticed about New Yorkers is the fact that they don't greet back. So... Okay. So as South Africans, we when we when we go to a restaurant because this is pizza place that I used to go to every day for a slice. So I would be like, "Hi, how are you?" And then she'd be like, "What are you having?" And I'm like, "Yay!" Hey, you skipped yeah. the whole part here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I, I can after see days and days, I realized it was normal. Then, I think it's like efficiency, like that's wasting time. You know, get the order so I can get to the next table or whatever. But um no i i think you're right I, I think i've noticed that too especially like in service related interactions yeah in south africa we greet we over greet in fact 
Awesome. Yeah. That's a good thing. That's friendly. <laughs> the, like, there's, uh, you, you quoted uh, uh, Wayne Dyer, so I, I want to uh, come back with Martin Buber, uh, who was a, uh, a great Jewish philosopher who talked about the I-thou um, relationship as opposed to the I-it relationship. So, you know, I think as comics, we have a proclivity to create these I-thou relationships where you're talking to somebody as though they're, um, because it's an opportunity when you talk to them as a human being, you talk to a cashier at the supermarket while they're checking out the groceries as a human being and maybe get a laugh out of them. Yeah. You know, it's the only laugh they'll get all day. It's yeah. the only time somebody treats them like a human being. Mm -hmm. And it's just a more fun way for me to go through life. Yes. You know, so, but, but many people choose the I, it kind of thing and treating people like things. Objects. Yeah. Ob wow. That'd be, I'm I think you're right. Like that's one. Like yeah. objects for his podcast. But I think as, I, as comics, we're probably more naturally inclined to treat people like people because we could get material out of it or get a laugh out of it. So we see it yes. more probably as an opportunity than most people. Yeah, they're yeah. like a mini audience, you know? Yeah. They're, yes. Uh, you know, yeah, I'll be like, tell my husband, wasn't this a hilarious joke I said in Starbucks today? <laughs> and he'll be like, good job. <laughs> But aren't you finding that sort of a thing hard? Obviously not like interacting with people as much. So are you finding it hard to kind of build material at this point? Um, a little bit. It's, I mean, it's also hard out in the world when you're wearing your masks, as hopefully everybody out there is. But I have noticed too, like not seeing people's mouths can affect yeah. what, how well they understand you and get like the tone in your vibe. Because if, you if you're making a joke, but they can't see your full facial expression, they may not know you're making a joke, and then they're kind of like, okay, just get out of here. Like, what, I don't know what <laughs> you're trying to do right now. So that's definitely been affected. But yeah, I mean, my material right now is mostly what's happening within these four walls. And I, I've talked to my other comic friends, too, of like, after quarantine, like, is everyone just going to have quarantine, pandemic, social distancing jokes? Can we all agree to not do that and just move on like it never yeah. happened and start like yeah. living our lives again so yeah I don't, I don't know it'll be interesting to see but yeah i mean my a lot of the humor i've come up like jokes i've come up with i feel like is fairly limited right now i just have one joke after it. in the room it's gonna be like we all made it yeah, that, that, that's, yeah. There's, 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 there's nothing more to it we we made it yeah <laughs> So everything that you experience in this show is just a bonus. Yeah, we made it. We're here now. <laughs> yeah. So if I, if I only get four laughs in this hour, that's four extra laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> it, it's a bonus. Don't, don't yell at me yeah. if it's only four because just appreciate yeah. those four. Yeah. You weren't guaranteed any, all right? You're just here. <laughs> you could have died. <laughs> yeah. You could have died. <laughs> That'll really lighten the mood. We all could be dead right now. <laughs> you could just start a great saver. You do a joke that doesn't, you know, that gets nothing, and you go, you know, you could be dead right now. <laughs> <laughs> you could could have died like my joke just did. Exactly. <laughs> you could even start a comedy club called like Da Laughing or something like that. <laughs> And if someone heckles you, you go, I wish you would die. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I used to do? You know, you talk about the fear thing and heckling. Um, the first couple of years of being, you know, a professional, um, I, I felt like I needed to deal with hecklers by besting them. Oh. And, you know, and, and that was always, and you could, but at, at, at some point, what I started doing was, like somebody would say, so yell something nasty, and I would say, oh, sir, you must have had a very difficult day to go out in public and to yell such things in public in front of your girlfriend and your wife. You must be under a lot of stress. But I have been heckled many, many times. This is your first time, probably. <laughs> That's good. Let me show you how it's done. And then I would leave the stage, 
and I would go and I would sit next to him or I'd sit on his lap <laughs> and I'd yell the most horrible things at the now empty stage. Uh-huh. Just yeah. terrible things about my parentage and about everything. And then I'd run back up on stage and I'd go, oh, well, sir, you, I don't think there's any. And then I'd go back and I'd sit next to him and I'd yell more horrible things. <laughs> and, the, it, you know, and that ate like four minutes of material yeah. that, frankly, I didn't have. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it all worked out. And then the audience knew, the, talk about holding the audience securely, the audience knew that nobody in this room can, can ruin our evening. Because yes. this guy's got it. He's, under, he's yes. got it all under control. You can say whatever you want, and he's yes. not going to let this train leave the tracks. Yes. He's you okay. Could probably say the, you could probably say neater things to yourself than anyone in that room could. So. <laughs> yes, because yeah. I know myself better. So. Yeah. You know, when it, when it comes to, like, Kat's point about the whole thing of, you know, doing, like, crowd work in the beginning, do you feel like that's sort of, like, the easiest way to kind of win over an audience? I, I personally, I don't know about Kat, but I, I personally think crowd work should be either in the middle or not at all. Because I feel like sometimes when you when you put it at the beginning, you're really picking on someone. It feels like you're picking on someone. Mm-hmm. It, it already feels like you're basing your success on someone else's misfortune. And people don't like bullies or being bullied. So already you're between a rock and a hard place. But if you do it in the middle, when you've built up a rapport with the audience and they know that you have no malicious intent, it's not because the person is at the front, it's not because they are overweight, it's not because their laugh is funny, then they know that it's just you being a comic. But if you start with, and I've seen people going in there and going, you over there, and I'm like, oh, my God. No, no one loves a bully and no one loves to be bullied. Those are the yeah. two rules of asshole behavior. And I'm like, hey, you're on your own now. I don't know how they get away with it, but I've, I, in my experience, I've seen that it goes horribly wrong from there, you know? Yeah, I People agree. Like, yeah, you got to get their trust at the beginning. I usually do, like, you know, do my jokes at the beginning. They know that I know, I know what I'm doing and I'm funny. Yeah. And then you kind of find natural places. Kind of in your set, I found a few natural places where it kind of works better with certain material and jokes than others. Like, there might be natural places for me to then go into the audience. Um, or unless something crazy happens, like someone has some crazy reaction or something that mm. it'd be weird if you didn't call out. But yes, um, yes. yeah, I feel like, I feel like, yeah, there's some things where I'm like, I can't ignore that. Or like <laughs> so, a snort or something. Yeah, something weird. Um, it's like a glass breaks at like kind of just the right time or something. Yeah. But um, yeah, I feel like the so middle the comedy is usually are the... smiling down on you. <laughs> and they do everything you ever ask for. They stop the clock, they drop glasses, they... <laughs> Everything just happens to me. Yeah. But, you know, like, that's one of the things, like, especially what I noticed is, you know, hosts, like, uh, the people who are hosting the shows, they go out there and they'll just start, like, ripping on the crowd straight away. So how does that tactic work? Or is it just a thing of, like, the audience is aware that this is the host? Well, yeah. I'm gonna, go ahead, Kat. No, no, go ahead. Well, I, I used to MC every night. Um, not because I didn't have material, but... Um, I didn't, but uh, (laughs) I used to, uh, my, my approach to crowd work was, and it's a subtle difference, but I think it's an important difference, was not making fun of the people I was interacting with, but having fun with. Um, Never doing stuff about a guy's size or weight or none of that stuff. Yeah. But using them sort of as a uh, an improv cue yeah. uh, for whatever was happening, you know, in my head at that moment, and also becoming either self-referential. So if anybody was going to be the brunt of something, it would be me mm-hmm. um, and, and not them. So you can do the Rickles thing. You can go after people. Um, but... It's not my, I, I never feel good when I go after people. Me too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that if, if people were to sh- just shift the crowd, because, because there is a default point of view of MCs going after people, but if you change the default to not making fun of, but having fun with, and then also using that as a cue to be self-referential, 
yeah. think it opens up new spaces as opposed to, oh, you know, is, is this your date or are you on a business trip or, yeah. you know, whatever it is. Yeah. You ripped them all, Bill. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, have, I might be at a, I guess, an, an, an advantage, disadvantage. Like, as a woman, because, like, you always want to be, like, punching up in comedy, right? But I feel like as a woman, my, I have the status of being the comic on stage, but in society, a woman's status, a white woman's status is lower than, like, a white man's status. So I can find, like, I can usually go after white men in the audience, if they're, you know, if clearly like they're game for it, you know, nothing too mean, but I can usually like make fun of them a little more. Like I would target maybe a white dude who's kind of been sitting with his arms crossed all night, but like, you know, his girlfriend's having a great time. Like I found it's the crowd's on my side if I make fun of him because status wise, I'm punching mm -hmm. up in a way because society's mm -hmm. agreed like, oh yeah, like you can make fun of him and we're with you. Um, so, and I find that works and like, and they laugh too. Like I would never do it if I saw like, yeah. they were not into it or something, but I've noticed, I was like, oh, it's interesting. Cause I, cause I'm kind of shifting that power dynamic by going after him. So I just, I've noticed that too, with like kind of gender dynamics of like who's on stage versus who they're making fun mm -hmm. of in the audience, you know, and how that kind of works. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also the punching up, punching down thing. You know, that, that's sort of a, a pet peeve of mine when, when people punch down. It, it's mm -hmm. not what comedy was invented for. Yeah. It, it was invented to afflict the powerful, yeah. you know, yeah. not to, you know, uh, you know, hit the afflicted. Yeah. So right. you, you got to punch across, punch yourself, punch, punch up, but uh, never down. It's, it's, a, it's a misuse of the form. Yeah. Yeah. Of the platform. Absolutely. Jeez, we should be like the comedy Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have powers. I'd be the guy going, wait, I have to fix the suit before I let out. I feel like Nick Fury in this situation because I just brought everyone together. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I actually, well, there was something. Go for it. Well, that, that's what I was in, in, in the, when we started the Comedy Cellar. Uh, I was Nick Fury. Uh, my, you know, secret little power was I could curate a room and curate an audience. Um, and I was just good enough as a, as a performer to host and to do what you were saying earlier, Eugene, you know, warm the crowd up so that they were prepared uh, for the, you know, and set the table so that if somebody didn't do didn't do great or, or did great, you know, somebody did super great. And then I would bring the room down to a more even level. So the next guy didn't have to, you know, follow this crush, yeah. you know, but could, you know, do their own thing, build their own space and time. And then if somebody didn't do so well, then I would do something, you know, audience pleasing to get the room back so that the next, next yeah. act, had, you know, I always, I always think about, I'm, I'm always like in comedy, it's no different from working in an office environment or in a corporation or being in the army. There's always going to be a hierarchy. You know, I was watching this Lance Armstrong documentary where in cycling, and when they're doing the Tour de France, is everyone on the team is not there to win the yellow jersey. Everyone in the team is there to help one guy win the yellow jersey. Yeah. In the army, it's the same thing. The infantry is not doing the same thing as what the tank division is doing or what the artillery division is doing so someone's gonna get hit first and that's the simple rules of life but somewhere somehow when you do stand up when you jump up on the stage knowing very well that your job is of an infantryman to take the shot or you're the domestique in the in the cycling team to kind of break the wind so that the guy can zoom past you kind of forget and those are the people that you look at and you go you've missed an opportunity to be great in your own space because you are not there to hit a home run you were there to tire out the pitcher. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what you were there for. You know, we're not all going to hit a slam dunk, but if we get out there and do what we need to do, we'll all be fine. And I think that's where the learning curve is in comedy, is once you've figured out your position and your strong point, and fears and insecurities have no room anymore mm -hmm. because you are secure in the fact that you've went into this corporation, you've clocked in and you know what your duties are, and if you're going to be faulted for anything, it wouldn't be for how you performed your duties. 
the variable must be things that you can't control. The fact that the audience came late or there's a natural disaster or no one has money. It's not it's that time of the month for when people don't have enough spending money. But it shouldn't be the fact that you didn't execute your job properly. You're the guy who blocked Lance Armstrong. What are you doing? <laughs> that's the worst place to be. Yeah, that's that's very, you know, I went, I went back to the cellar back in uh, January, uh, having not done, done stand up for a while. And, um, and I did a few sets with entire, like 15 minutes of entirely new material. And so, you know, <clears throat> you know, that's crazy to even, even try. Yeah. Right. Nuts. But, <clears throat> but I wanted to see, um, not as an MC, but I wanted to see just experience it again just going up doing sets and 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 what was interesting was i i i sort of kind of conf reconfirmed my 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 self image as as a stand up not in a, not in a tremendously great way yeah. but i felt because since i left you know since i came to california i've been a writer i've been writing television scripted comedy and my, and I have no fear about that. Yes. Uh, I'm incredibly prolific. I'm yes. incredibly fast, as opposed to when I was a stand-up where I was not prolific at all. Hmm. And so to go back and to even have 15 minutes, the other guys at the cellar were going, when did you start writing stand-up? <laughs> yeah. What happened yeah. to all the bullshit crowd work? That you <laughs> We're expecting you to do, you know, the Flintstones again. What, what, yes. what happened? And what happened? I said, well, I decided, well, maybe I can, you know, actually write this stuff. And it went very well, but not to that level that I, you know, that other people can get to. And I felt like, oh, I was right being casting myself as the guy who has to break the wind for, you should pardon the expression, uh, for yeah. Lance Armstrong, you yeah. know, set yeah. the table so the other people, uh, because good, but not, not what you do, Eugene, and Kat, excuse me, I haven't seen your stuff, but, uh, you know. It's really good. Oh, see, <laughs> and so not what either of you two can get to, but uh, I feel like, yeah, I was confirmed, yeah, I'm good, but not, not as good. It, f when I write a scripted half-hour comedy, I really feel like if you can find somebody who writes this stuff better, get yeah. him. Yes. Get him. Because th this shit is pretty good. Yeah. And that's the ultimate confidence, right? That's what, we all, that's what we're all seeking for. That's our purpose in life, to know that we're genuinely good at something. You could wake me up at whatever time in the night and then I'll be able to perform. You know? I don't think yeah. Peyton ever... Uh, asked himself if he can do this or not. You know, he knew. My he knew he was a great yeah. My wife has tried that to get me to perform in, in the middle of the night. <laughs> but I've, 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 I've always wanted to know because you guys both are writers. What is the transition like from going from stand up to writing? Because I'm trying to dabble into that, uh, and I find it it takes me a lot longer to get my brain into writing and putting things down than it would be on thinking and writing down a few notes and jumping on stage and actually doing it. Me, it helped. I was always interested in, I haven't done like, um, like 30 minute, you know, scripted, uh, comedy, but I've been doing mostly late night and it always helped me. I always love late night me. That's what I would have preferred to do in the writing comedy world. Um, having like a packet, I don't know, have you ever like done or looked at like late night submission packets, Eugene? Cause pretty much, like back like in LA between like 2014 and 2017 I just kind of was submitting to like every late night show and it would be hard to like motivate myself like I'd be like okay I'll write you know like 20 monologue jokes today but sometimes I would do it sometimes I wouldn't but when I knew there was like oh this show's looking for writers here's the packet I would like hunker down and do mm -hmm. it um, which helped, or even just getting a hold of a packet. Maybe they weren't looking for it at the time, but knowing, okay, this is what they're looking for. I can work on this and write this. Um, so me, I mean, definitely, I'm the person who needs a project and a deadline to kind of force me to do something outside of stand-up. Stand-up, I was like, oh, I have a show this Saturday. 
I need to write and perform and write for that show. But for these like writing projects, I needed some sort of tangible hard deadline or something substantive that I could like mm -hmm. do and know I hadn't a lot of time to do it. Um, so that's what kind of kicked my butt into gear was having those packets and having them continue to get rejected and motivation to do better on the next one. <laughs> You see, that, that is a, an entire, to answer your question, Eugene, using what Kat just said, because you see, Joshua, what I try to do is I try to incorporate everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, what Kat writes is a different kind of writing than a, a, a story-based uh, sitcom, a half-hour scripted comedy. But what I always do, because I've written jokes for um, you know, award shows, for instance. I've done a ton of Academy Awards, uh, Emmy Award, telecasts, Grammys, uh, award shows. And what I always look for is the story. Mm -hmm. the, the story that's inherent in that moment. Mm -hmm. So I, I'll give you an example. Chris Rock, uh, before he uh, became famous, he was, he was kind of on the verge. Mm -hmm. And he was, this is going back in the day where Bryant Gumbel had just left the Today Show. I don't know if this is going way back, but Bryant Gumbel had just left hosting the Today Show and moved to CBS. And as part of that, he was hosting the Emmy Awards. Mm -hmm. And... Brian Gumbel, wonderful man, not the funniest guy in the world, but okay. So he's hosting the Emmy Awards and somebody had to write Chris Rock's stuff. So the first thing that I ask, because I'm looking for the story in the moment, I was, I, first thing I ask is where, what's going on? Where in the rundown is he? And mm -hmm. so I saw the rundown, Brian Gumbel comes out introduces Ellen DeGeneres, you know, does his monologue, introduces Ellen DeGeneres, comes out, does her thing. She goes away. Brian Gumbel comes back out, does a couple of things, introduces Chris Rock. So what does Chris Rock say? So what I wrote for Chris was, he comes out, and I knew that nobody in the house knew him at that point. He, was, he didn't know who he was, right? So he comes out and he says, and, and you have to know, this, 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 references to the cbs motto slogan at that time okay he comes out and he says well so far all you've seen is two black guys and a lesbian cbs welcome home <laughs> <laughs> and, CBS, and welcome home was the cbs motto yeah. at the time. it got the biggest laugh i ever heard in that room because it's the unspoken thing that it was in everybody's head. Mm -hmm. You know, it was drafting off of who is this guy? Yes. And it was acknowledging the reality of the moment. Yeah. Yes. And it was doing it in a, in, in a time, this is in the 90s. So it was doing it in a time where that would be like edgy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, to call that out, just it was edgy without making fun of it. It was not mm -hmm. punching down. It was not say. It was just acknowledging the moment. The moment, yes. So anyway, so so Eugene, you know, it, it, with your stuff, if if you were going to try to write, um, you know, non stand up or trying to write something else, mm -hmm. you know, to me that's a logical. That's sort of an organic uh, segue. Is to. Really? Yeah, for to start from, because you're telling you're telling stories, you're yeah. telling character based mm -hmm. stories. Your your point of view, the way it comes across to me, is a guy who's annoyed, but amused by the annoyance. <laughs> Are you in my head? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's no there's no anger. It's not angry. Oh, no. You're annoyed, you're frustrated, and you're amused by how annoyed you are at this stuff. Yep. yep. So to me, that's, that's, an in, that's a very inherently powerful comedic point of view. Wow. It's amazing how you managed to dissect that. 
So that's how I feel all the time. Yeah, I, that's incredible. I do feel whenever I'm, I'm doing stuff, you're right, that I feel the, the observation in me is from a point of annoyance, but I find it funny that I'm annoyed by that. Yeah. Because ultimately I realize that it's, it's something that I do myself. Then I find myself laughing in between because I've just stumbled. <laughs> I've just, I've just seen myself in a scenario that I've painted. You're absolutely you. This is what I, this is what I, this is what I love doing. I love doing this. I love, you know, watching people who can, who can do that thing that I'm not good enough to do, but I'm good enough to know what's going on. Yeah. you know and what the physics of it are and to just make slight little adjustments that empower that person that's amazing that's You're an like amazing breaking skill. down a character to it's like core which makes them what like that's like what you need to do in a sitcom like who is this character and then how are they going to play with this character so that yeah. man yeah Got who <laughs> who are they what are they what are they trying to get yeah and what stands in their way. That's amazing. Who are they? Sorry, sorry, Josh. Who are they? What are they trying to get? And what stands in their way? That's, that's, every, that's every joke. That's every story. That's everything. And, and when, I, when I work with writers or when I teach this stuff, it's the first thing I say. You know, I, I say, you know, I can give you an MFA in television writing uh, in 30 seconds or in in 30 weeks but here's the 30 second version is who wants what what are they yeah. trying actively to get and what's yeah. stopping them from getting it that that's it and now we can discuss it and we can try it and we can do it we can get better at it whatever but that's all it's going to be and then if you have two scenes then you add the second thing of causality so now the guy's trying or the woman is trying to get something, trying hard by the end of that scene or the end of that beat, they have either failed What's and they're exactly? in bigger trouble yes. or they've succeeded and now they're in bigger trouble. So, and as a result of that, what does that cause them to do in the next beat? So if that's all you know, the first thing and the second thing of causality and you keep making the problem bigger, then your script will not stink. Will it be great? It depends on how funny you are, but it won't stink. Yeah. I and guess what you've just described is the reason why we love shows like The Ozark and Breaking Bad and uh, Better Call Saul is no matter how much Saul tries to get himself out of a rut, he just ends up in a rut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, yes. He just always well, tries. Yeah. It is amazing how it works for both comedy and drama. Like, it's the same thing. It's either a more heightened intense result or a funnier result. And yeah. what you've just, yeah. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Go ahead. no, 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 you what, you, what you've just described now as, as how to break down a character is what has made me love certain shows over others. Because ultimately I love closure when I'm watching a show, even if it's a series, I love closure. I love knowing that this guy tried and he failed and I'm going to watch the next episode again and he might try or fail again. But all I want is closure at the end of the day. When the episode finishes, I want to feel like I felt something. I can either empathize with the person or I can either despise them afterwards. You know, when they, they evade the law. I want to know, I want to have closure. If that is in the last, last episode that I watch, I want to feel like I, I know that person now. That it's like the same for your stand-up set. Like if you drew an hour of stand-up, that's probably how the audience feels about you. Like I know who the, I know who he is. He's kind of brought me to this point where I feel satisfied that he's done his job here and you're not resolving anything, but yeah. I mean, maybe yeah, you're not maybe solving you are in a way. But, but I think yeah. that there's one show that actually counters that and that's It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia because it's got such <laughs> yeah. like an offbeat sort of thing. It's an anti-sitcom. So yeah. would you say it kind of goes against that formula? Then I would, I would not, I would not like it because I love, <laughs> I love closure. I guess that's why we love, we love the Simpsons. You know, we, we knew who Bart was. We knew who everyone was. It was just once in a while when they'll have a guest feature. And even then, because they're so famous, you know how the story's going to end. It's the closure. 
is I want to know where this is in. That's why I can't deal with Instagram's infinite scrolling. Like, there's no closure for me. I'm like, ah. Well, like like when, when you tell a joke, you want to have a punchline. And the punchline is the inherent closure of it. And you might have another joke on top of that. But that's, I think that's what you're talking about, that sense of, of closure. You, even if your, your story has been very amusing all the way through, you tell a very amusing story, but if it doesn't then have a punchline, it, makes you, it leaves the audience unsatisfied with no closure. My biggest, my biggest dream is to write, is to do stand up the way Paul Simon does music. I just With want to take you on a journey and then you must feel something at the end of the day. And then yeah. after that, we all part ways feeling good about ourselves. That's incredible. Yeah. That's really incredible. That's a very high bar. It's <laughs> yeah. a very high bar. When it's I was a be comedy, like the John Lennon of comedy, you know, <laughs> like. I can do that. Yeah. No, it's good. It's but you you could actually do that. You see, that's yeah. why it that's why it's not it's not uh, it's comp that is a perfectly great aspiration. And by the way, from what I've seen of your stuff, I get the feeling you're closer to that than Thank you're you. implying. Thank you. I always feel, I always feel like I'm fur I'm further on. I always feel like the I nudge closer and like. And I watch someone very brilliant and I go, I wish I could do that as well, you know? So the work in progress, but I hope so. That's how I know it's a good joke. If I listen to it and I, my reaction is, I wish I wrote that. Like, that's like how I know it's like the best joke ever when I'm jealous that I didn't write it. It's like seeing someone perform, like, I wish. Yes. That, like that. But there are, there are other comics who are good at telling jokes and there's others who are good at telling the truth. I feel like current, current affairs comics are good at telling the truth. There's nothing funny about what they're saying. It's just that they're saying it because it does exist. Mm -hmm. And there are other comics that literally have to weave a yarn, you know, just spin your yarn, just create this picture in front of you. And at the end of the picture, you just like, I just want to be in that picture. You know, there's just like yeah. great forge, forgeries. And there's just other comics just come and say, well, there's a scene behind me. And as you can see, devastation. And then the audience goes, thank you for that. I yeah. wanted to see the carnage. You just brought it into my life. And I think those two categories of comics, I think when I was starting out comedy, I was kind of confused as to who I wanted to be between the two of them. Did I want to be the guy who, the newscaster with a microphone and stands there in the scene as everything is burning down? Or did I want to be the great forger, you know, that makes the best Mona Lisa fake ever to a point where even the greatest art critic could be like, that could pass as a Mona Lisa. And then, you know, you, you, you get stuck in there. And then by observing the two kinds of comics, I kind of knew where I wanted to be, you know. I wanted to tell the best lie possible and get away with it. That was my, that was my motto operandi. I just wanted to be able to, to go out there and make up a story that you would believe. And then you'd either think I wasn't in it or definitely I was in it. One of the two, you'd get the closure, like you mentioned, Mm -hmm. I'm starting to see it now as I'm talking about it in my comedy that I, I do get to those points of this is what I want and this is how I'm going to get to it or this is what's stopping me. I never, it was automatic. <laughs> Where have you been, Bill? <laughs> it, it kind of on that note of like the Mona Lisa's of like comedies and everything. Um, Bill, did you know Richard Pryor? Because I know that you actually produced a couple of his documentaries. Did you know him personally? Well, yeah, what I did was, and actually this, this goes back to, to what we were talking about with, with Eugene. And Kat, I'm so sorry that I haven't seen your stuff. I'd That's love totally to, fine. I'd love to opine. I, I opine about anything, even if I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. I'm happy. Um, but I did the last two projects of Richard's life. And one was a scripted show where I deconstructed his material um, and and created um, created in 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 three dimensions um, the characters and the stories that he that he did as a stand-up yeah. so so I you know I created there was the Richard character Eddie Griffin played the the Richard character and uh, there was this white woman who was a compendium of all the white women that he talks about in his act. And yes. there was a 
black woman who was a compendium of all many of the black women. And then there was his grandmother and his, you know, all these stories that he did. And so I, I deconstructed his, I, I would sit there and listen to his material and deconstruct it into those components. And then who wants what guided the whole thing. And, and he was, he was ill at that time. And, and he was, you know, towards the end of his life. Um, he could, one of the things was I would show him a cut. I'd go to his house and I'd show him a cut. And like, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, we would have the Richard character on stage, Eddie Griffin on stage doing, I don't know if you know his, his routine about um, his grandmother uh, beating him with a switch. Yes. Yes. The grandmother was a pimp. Yeah, in, in this, you know, brothel in, you know, yeah. Illinois. Um, so Eddie's on stage, Eddie, the Richard character, is on stage doing this bit and getting laughs from the audience doing this bit about his grandmother beating him with this switch, right? And he had to go out and get the switch and come back, mm -hmm. right? And then we would do, we, we did a flashback to the actual event so that now you see little Richard six years old and this fierce grandmother and this, this threat and this beating. And it's not funny at all. It's horrific. Yes. It's, it's use. And you yes. see the world, you know, he's a little kid in this brothel surrounded by all of this debauchery and horribleness and you see it in real life. Mm -hmm. And then, we, I pre lap the laughs, the audience laughter, I pre lap so that you're hearing the audience laugh over this horrific situation. Oh. And we come back to present day where he's on stage doing the bit. Yes. So turning the bit inside out and showing you how that showing, not explaining, showing how sure. this guy takes his pain. Mm -hmm. And from the deepest pain possible, creates laughter. Mm. And so, you know, the, the, the hook of the show wasn't laugh till you cry, it was cry till you laugh. Mm. So, so that, that was like the last scripted thing that, that Richard was involved in. And then when I would show him, oh, that's, this is my point, I would show him this cut, he could not watch the flashbacks. Mm. He would avert his eyes because it was just too real. Yeah. Too real. What's the name of that project? It was called Prior Offenses. Is that Did it for, for Showtime. It was a it was a special uh, slash backdoor pilot, and uh, it got caught in a regime change. So when we made it, it was for one boss, and then uh, when it was time to order new series, it was a new boss who had brought in the rights to barbershop the series. And so there was no, you know, politically, this is the way things go. There's no upside to green lighting the last guy's show because there's no way to get credit for it. You can only get the blame. So it wow. never went to air or anything? No, it went to air, it did, but okay. it didn't go to series. Ah, uh, okay. So, so there's a, no way of us catching it or watching it somewhere? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I'm going to go, f I'll find out and I'll tell Josh. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I'd also like to see it. I mean, Mark Epps, he was doing a movie with Richard Pryor, like a biopic. And then that just also never came into fruition. Yeah, it's, it's been, uh, you know, doing a bio version since his death has been kind of a snake bit kind of situation. I'm not exactly sure why. But it's a, you know, it's a tremendous story. When I, if, I mean, I can tell you another Richard story from. Oh, I hear. Uh, sorry, Josh. I, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm so intrigued by this. <laughs> Let, let's completely vote Josh out. What do you say, huh? What do you say? I'm leaving the tribe. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, when I was doing Cryer Fences, uh, his, his, his wife, um, 
Jennifer, who was both his, he was married eight times, Richard. And oh. yes, and his sixth and eighth wife were both Jennifer. He, he married the same woman. Oh, no, same. same Jennifer, yeah. Oh. He married the same woman twice. Oh. Um, Seventh must have been pretty bad if he went back to sex. <laughs> 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 it's never really sure how many times he was married. He was pretty sure it was six or seven or eight times. <laughs> um, but she let me read his, his journal. He kept these journals in these big leather bound journals. And I didn't know that he kept journals. Um, but in reading his journals, what struck me was his handwriting and his spelling was that of a guy who left school after the fourth grade, which is what he did. Mm -hmm. But the insights, the mm -hmm. things that he had to say were so brilliant. And it, it kind of brought tears to my eyes because I would say, how many other Richards are yeah. there out there? Absolutely. Brilliant people who yeah. have been failed by schools or society, whatever, and we're not going to be the beneficiary of what they have to offer because they weren't able to overcome what Richard was able to overcome. You know, but this com this contrast between this the writing of an illiterate mm -hmm. expressing brilliance, mm -hmm. it, it was just it was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And then also just a fanboy there were his set lists from the uh, from the films, from the concert films, you know, and, and seeing the set list from the concert films was was kind of like seeing the Beatles set list when they played Shea Stadium. Yeah. Wow. You know, it was it was great. It was great. great. So the fact that there is a script that has a title page that says written by Richard Pryor and Billy Grundfest. Mm. You know, that's it. It doesn't yeah. get that. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It's amazing. Yeah, Where do you think is. those journals are now? Do you think one of his kids probably has them? Oh, no, I think probably Jennifer still has them. Jennifer is alive and well and occasionally tries to, you know, get a bio pick, you know, going. You know, it's, it's going to take a, a champion to champion it because as time goes by, you know, people don't remember. I forget. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're right. But I have to admit, his book, uh, Prior Convictions, has to be one of the wildest books I've ever read. I was going through it and I was like, there's no way this could be real. I mean, his whole journey is just, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, and he went, I think he went through this kind of um, evolution asking himself what you were saying, Eugene, about well, who am I going to be, you know, because he started out being, you know, a, a Bill Cosby wannabe, just mm. really nice and really pleasing the audience and mm. doing impressions and being really likable and like a puppy dog kind of thing. And, but I think the fact that he is, that he was so inherently likable and mm. so inherently uh, non-threatening as a person mm -hmm. that when he got into all this racial stuff and you know when he when he became people it, it, people could white people could accept it because mm -hmm. they didn't feel like oh he's gonna kill us he's gonna you know they felt like he's telling us the truth mm -hmm. but he's he's so likable we can yes. we we can sit with this truth. We can tolerate this. Yeah. Mm. I also think that Dave Chappelle does that particularly well. Oh yeah, I think he does a lot particularly well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he, he's great. And you know, again, not to keep blowing smoke up e Eugene's, uh, you know, frame, but. You know, the stuff that I've seen, and, and I don't know that it was 10 years ago, the, the videos that I've seen. What, really, really, was it 10 years ago? Because it says, yeah. like, you put up a year ago or whatever. Because it's not, and funny enough, any, everything that's online is stuff that I've never put up myself. 
other people do it and I don't do it. I've, I've, I think I've recorded like seven one man shows that I've never released and I've never put up clips about of it anywhere. So the stuff that's there, it's stuff that's been like, and I hardly ever check. But whenever I bump into it, I'm like, oh my God. And then I skip past. <laughs> So it's people who were like at the show in the audience who recorded and put it up. In yes, or they've gotten, or maybe they used to work at the edit suite where some of the stuff was edited and then they'll be like, I like this and then they'll put it out. You know, But I've, I've never been, personally, I've never, yeah. Well, you've, like, done, you've done seven one-man shows with different material in each of those shows and each show running, what, 60, 75 minutes? An hour and 20 minutes. So it's 80 minutes. So you have written uh, 560 minutes of Yo, material. When you, when you put it like that, it makes me go, woo woo. That's, <laughs> like, that's like 10 hours. Like, yes. Yeah. Kat, what do you think of that? 560 minutes of material. I mean, I have one album at, out and I don't like half of it already. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I also enjoy remember, I also enjoy performing from recollection because I feel like I can embellish or downplay other scenarios that I didn't see, I, I, I saw, you know, in another way, in another time. Mm. Sometimes I look, I frame these shows in my head as other lifetimes where I'm like, if I remember that joke, properly then i get to do it the way i wish i did it when i was driving back home so that i've got this comfort zone that i've never released the shows and they've never seen the light of day in on the internet or in people's dvd shelves if that still exists so then when i perform the material i still feel intrigued by the material and i can exaggerate it or downplay it as much as i like but i i still feel like Paul Simon, once again, you know, after I released Graceland, there was no need for anything else. We forgot about Art Garfunkel. We forgot about that time. As soon as we, we, we heard Graceland, it was over. It was a culmination of everything he had learned from Lady Smith, Black Mambazo, Ray Piri, and going to Graceland and seeing the memorial of Esmus Presley, you know, and driving with his granddaughter to go see it. It was, it was a culmination of being at Madison Square Garden with Art Garfunkel and playing the hippie stuff and being out there in those shows. You always, I always feel like someone, you know, we will always remember someone for something. And it goes back to what you said. I can't believe that everything just drives back to that point. And, you know, we, we, we want to create our best works and knowingly or unknowingly, we are trying to achieve that pinnacle, you know, that the reason why this was. And I feel like the day I feel it, and I was saying to Josh last podcast, and I was like, the day I meet a director who's going to know what I'm thinking and, and sees my brain from the material, that's the day I'll record a show that I'll put out in public. Because right now I feel like I'm self-indulging. Wait, wait say, say, say that again. The, the day that you meet a director that does what? that can see my head inside my head, you know, can see my jokes and decipher the meaning or where they come from, from within. That's the day I'll be convinced to do a show that I can record and put out there. It, Cause right now it just feels like it's self-indulgent, you know? And that's what, that's what Paul Simon did. When he came to South Africa, he left it all up to Lady Smith, Black Mambazo and Ray Piri and said, teach me how to do this. I can teach you about folk music and country and we can play the riff, but then you teach me how the bass guitar sounds in this country and the harmonies sound, then Graceland was created. So when you give yourself an opportunity to learn from someone by them looking into you, I think I want to reach that point. I want someone to go, that's what's going on in there. Let's put it out there. I'm curious though, the ones that you have recorded but not released, have you watched them and felt like they didn't reach you haven't even watched them. I haven't even watched them. No. So you just kind of knew, do, like doing it, you knew it wasn't what you wanted it to be. Or I, I, I never felt like it was my Graceland. <laughs> it never felt like my 40 licks, if, if anything. You know, it was, was not my born in the USA. It was not my, it was not the album. It was not the, it, it was not the thoughts that I had engraved in my subconscious for life. 
sometimes it were things that were, and like you were saying, Bill, because sometimes I feel the frustration and I marvel at it or I find amusement in it. And sometimes I look back at those things and I'm like, I don't find that irritating anymore. I don't find that amusing anymore. You know, so how do I come, how do I put the two together and make one show? And that has been my, like I sit on long flights and I, I don't know what to feel. Cause I feel like it's there, but I don't know where it is. I think maybe you just have to put out like a nookie before you put out a Graceland, you know, like, except the, I'm like, I mean, I love that you're shooting for such a high standard for yourself. Cause I definitely look at the album I've put out and I'm like, Ooh, that joke is okay. But I also feel like I learned something from the process of having put something out there that I can then put that to rest and mm. start new again being a better comic naturally because I've just been doing it more. Like, you know, the longer you do it, the more stage time, you're just going to become better. So I feel like it kind of helped me get closure on some old material or old yeah. stage personas and be able to like kind of move forward. But I mean, yeah, I don't know if I'll ever have a Graceland. So, oh, and, and, and me, forget about it. Forget <laughs> about it. Graceland. Uh, again, I got. I, I I've I've been teaching myself piano, and I've got uh, my new show is called Eight Chord Songs and Humorous Banter. <laughs> <laughs> All I have. All inspired by the Brazilian piano bar. <laughs> That's right, the Brazilian piano bar. Um, when you do seven, eighty-minute shows, how? many how long is it between those shows how oh. long do you take to develop the 80 minutes yeah. and then and then how long do you do that show for a year between shows some of them and then i've done the show maybe six or seven times never more than that so so if i understand your process you you do spots and clubs to build up the the 80 minutes of material of new material no so I've, I've, I've done shows i think half of my shows where where i've taken a sabbatical from even clubs themselves and i've gone on and i've done a show and i said let's see what happens you know because I, I enjoy that with entirely yeah. new material yeah what are you crazy <laughs> i i know i felt like that sometimes and i would look at myself and i'd be like this is ridiculous why am i even doing this and i would do it and i'd feel good I feel good afterwards, you know, because I always, in my head, I always knew. It was almost like I had a phase in my life where I wanted to commit uh, career suicide. If you, if you, I wanted to be found out. I felt like I was a fraud. You know, I felt like I was so good at this thing without trying. And mind you, when I started doing stand-up, I hadn't watched one stand-up video in my life. I didn't know what stand-up was. I went with a friend who was a stand-up. And he did stand up and he was talking about stuff. And I said, I had stuff to talk about, but it irritated me in the day. And I spoke about the stuff and I laughed at myself while talking about this stuff. So I always felt, I always had this innate um, insecurity about it. I always felt like I was a fraud. I, I, so I started half of the seven shows. I started wanting, I didn't prepare because I wanted to be found out. I thought one day I was going to be on stage and someone's going to go, Got you. That is not the Mona Lisa, you know. And it, it it was it was it was my style. I kind of I kind of enjoyed creating art like Basquiat instead of trying to be the I'm trying to trying to be Van Gogh. Whoever I I I putting the images and taking it here and putting it there, not having a structure and not having a regimen, not having a set list. It made me feel good, you know. It, it was you actually when I watched the documentary about Basquiat. Have you watched it? I've There's a documentary I've, I've seen on a flight about Basquiat and you see how he just saw art and he saw creation. And, and this is a guy who was uh, mentored by Andy Warhol. So you can only imagine when you hang around that, that scene, you know, the guy who's very famous and tells you, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. And you're the guy who made these paintings and sold them in a the subway for a dollar. Now people have that and it's worth thousands of dollars now. And you know, it just, if you know what you know at that point in time, I think I feel like that's the most important thing ever. You know, when you know it, 
when you just know it at that time, at the perfect time, I live for those moments of knowing. Well, see that that's that's like that's the that's one difference between you and me because you feel like you're a fraud or you were feeling like you're a fraud when yeah, you're so not. And absolutely. I was afraid that people would find out I was a fraud, and I totally am. And that's the <laughs> that's the difference. My fear is based in total reality. I'm just trying to get away with something, but you. <laughs> You actually know what you're doing. Thank you. I, I try. I try. But I can't wait, though. You made me. This was a therapy session for me. You made me want to. <laughs> you've made me want to start writing Graceland. And I'm looking forward to it. I want to live it first, then talk about it. I would, you know, I would love to see this stuff that you haven't put on. I mean, yeah. wouldn't you, Kat? Yeah. I know. I'm, I'm very intrigued. I'm going to go do some. Uh, digging through YouTube after this. No, that's that's the stuff that other people put on YouTube. So I've got. Is, it, is there stuff that you put, that you have put on though? No. No, oh, he hasn't but, put. Well, then, YouTube it is. You should no, just that's do the stuff that I, that other people have put on. So yeah. if you go in, that's apparently. Yeah, in between those years, but I I I I love hearing. I would love to see something new from you. Yeah, Josh, you know, you see what you did now. <laughs> what, what is the comedy scene like in South Africa? What is your what is your life like as a as a comic? There's not enough there's not enough rooms to play, and I know that sounds cliche. From five years ago, I mean from ten years ago, when there was a lot of rooms, because we also used to have rooms of our own. But now there's no. So whenever I want to do material that I can play anywhere. Then I'll have to, in Johannesburg, then I'll have to go do Parker's. It's a great comedy club. It's got all the ingredients that you need for a comedy club. If I want to practice international material, then I have to go all the way to Cape Town at the Cape Comedy Club. Because they've got comedy four days out of the week, right, Josh? And then they've, yeah, got, I... they've got an international audience. So because the touristy environment at the vna waterfront so there you get to play to any type of person that walks through the door so you have those two clubs for me that's what i usually balance my comedy life in you know so i i either go to cape town or i'm playing in johannesburg i either go to cape town or i'm playing johannesburg and other than that there's clubs where you just know that you're just not going to be yourself you know you just know it you just know that you're not going to be yourself I and i don't know that might put pressure on each set too to be as good as it can be. Because if you have like limited opportunities to like actually perform and try out this material, absolutely, that, that puts so much pressure on. Okay, I've got to try it this time. Because I think yeah. are there a lot of comics fighting for those few venues? Like, is it the very scene is very small? Yeah. Okay. Also, there is also that, but there are clubs or rooms that people perform in that I basically would never go and perform in because I feel like even if I did, it wouldn't make a difference to how I view my... In fact, I would come out of there with the material that I know works, thinking that it doesn't work. Yeah. So I don't... I, <laughs> I know those rooms. I don't, I don't even... Call, you know those rooms where you're oh, like... Yeah. You're like, oh, I wow, this just made me feel home. terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a good Terrible. Job, I shouldn't be doing this at all. Yeah. <laughs> It killed last week in front of a hundred people, but these three people might know better than yeah. them. So I should kill it. Like you so guys don't deserve, deserve it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't deserve it. Whenever I see the scene in, in, in the US, I'm like, you guys are blessed. I'm like, if you see in the US, if you are bad anything, you know, you guys take it for granted because you live there or you were raised there. Mm -hmm. You don't understand. If you're good at porn, you can make a living. If you're good at writing, you can make a living. If you're good at drawing, you can make, if you're good at anything in that country, you can make a living out of. Do you understand how the margin to be mediocre is very, very, very small? Yeah. Right? There, I mean, the opportunity is huge. I also feel like though there's, I mean, a ton of people trying to do it. At least, I mean, I feel like every year there's just more. A lot of my friends now, like since I started 12 years ago, most of my friends and peers who I kind of started with are getting those acting gigs or those writing gigs and are like now making a living out of it. Um, but there's definitely a handful who are still, they've been at it for, you know, over 10 years and still struggling 
to break through because there's like thousands of people trying to do it. And you know what that you know what that theory is like? It's like saying there are directors now that are thriving producing movies and series and doc for Netflix. But 10 years ago, they would have never existed. So if they had walked into a big studio 10 years ago with this idea, it would have never flown. You, people would have just basically said, no, not today. But we, your country gives you time. Yeah. See, if, if, you yeah. know what? I, in your country, you could be famous older. Yeah, that's true. Which is yeah. not, it's not the case for other countries. You can't be old and famous. You can, or you can't get fame old. But in, in America, you certainly can. We, did, we don't know Louis C.K. as a spring chicken. Right. As South Africans. We don't know him. But what, what was he doing 15, 20 years ago? Or Sebastian Maniscalco. I just know him as a grown man with two kids or whatever. How many kids? But where was he as a 25-year-old? Do you understand? So your country, the U.S. has that. It gives you an opportunity to do it over and yeah. over again. Yeah, you can, there's other jobs you can be working while you're still doing comedy. Like, you can make a living, feed yourself, pay your rent in L.A. while you're hitting the clubs every night. Yes, and the, yeah. the, the trick is with that kind of environment that you guys have over there yeah. is fame. So if you want to be well compensated and famous, you might have a harder time than someone who just wants to be well compensated. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, don't, listen, you, you, when you're trying to balance the multiple things of I want to be true to my art or craft, I want to be uh, compensated, I want to be well compensated, I want to be famous. <laughs> That's true. Now you're trying to intersect all of those things. That's, that is a high wire act, you know, yeah. that, that's difficult. It's, it's yeah. kind of, it's much easier if all you want to do is one of those things. Yeah. And I guess it comes to that thing, yeah. You must know where you fall in the Tour de France team, you know. Are you, the, are you Lance Armstrong or are you the domestique? Just choose. But also, That's Eugene, uh -huh. also to your point, the thing is you could also build your craft in the U.S. a lot quicker because, as you said, like in South Africa, we've got so few clubs that you can perform like only once a night. Whereas if you go to New York, you could do like five gigs in one night. So you yeah. could build yeah. that whole, yeah. And I've seen, I've seen comics there after I said, they go, ooh, ooh, that was brutal. Oh, I gotta do it again. And I'm like, you don't <laughs> know how lucky you are. I know. You should be thankful you get to do it again. Yeah. You just say, I ha now I have to do it again? Yeah. Now you know, like, I would to die do to do it again. again. Yeah. You get to instantly relive a life that you had. Do you understand how nagging it is to drive home? and think I could have done this better and you have to wait for another week, you yeah. can just rectify your mistake within 15 minutes yeah. and know if you're doing it right or not. And I, I, I saw it back because most people didn't know I was a comic, so they would be like, ooh, that was, that was brutal. And, and <laughs> I also found that comics there ask each other's opinion far more than that they should. Oh, yeah. Far more than they should. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. How, how was that? How was that? Do you like that last bit? And I'm like, the audience was there laughing or they didn't laugh. You should know. But why are you asking? Because you find that there is that whole, there are, I guess, comics that they respect in the hierarchy mm -hmm. and then their opinion matters. Because also, I forget that after the club, there's a touring and the opening and the blah, blahs. So you also want to impress someone to invite you over to open for them or to come and work on their show or whatever mm -hmm. it is. But I find that that asking for permission and, and that, that submissiveness and it that's, just diminishes right. the whole I've demigod status. I've seen that done, but I've never done that. I've never come off stage and asked well done. someone what they thought of a joke. So I'm like, I, the audience told me, I know. <laughs> like, if something didn't, I might ask, like, one of my good friends, like, oh, this bit didn't work. Do you think, like, this is why? Like, I might ask them for, like, some tag or, or writing feedback. Or maybe like a performance, I'll be like, should I have put the mic this way or that way? Like, I might ask a good friend that I trust that, yeah. but not just whatever comic I know that's watching. Because I, I feel like I know myself enough to know whose opinion and feedback Man, matters. Definitely. And it's like the audience or my friend who I know is a good writer. <laughs> then you've reached the ultimate confidence of a comic then. It means you have... Well, it took 12 years, so... <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you know, also there's a certain uh, undercurrent of conformity yeah. that, you know, is, is sort of uh, ironic because we all get into this business because we're nonconformists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you get into this society and there's a little bit of conformity so that if you're not, you know, you know, in some, in some of these subcultures, for instance, yeah. if you're not a pure monologist, yeah. then you're kind of looked down on. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, to me, I, I love carrot top. I love ventriloquism. <laughs> yeah. I love, you know, funny magic guys of, and, yeah. and song parodies. And I mean, I love every, and I don't know why there aren't more double acts. You know, what, what happened to, you know, two guys or a guy and a, and a girl on stage at the same time, you know, other than splitting the money, I understand that, but, you know, <laughs> you know, instantly become different because going to your point, Kat, about how many uh, performers there are now, it, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and it's like, if you want to be um, compensated, well compensated, famous, Mm -hmm. And I'm leaving alone the artistic and the craft yeah. of it. Yeah. It's good. almost like... Do you want to be good? <laughs> yeah, we're not, we're not dealing with good. Yeah. Not, good is, is different. Different, pro, high-class problem. Yeah. But if you, if you want to... You ha in order to do those things, you have to first be different. You have to cut through. And there are so many ways that you could cut... That a performer could cut through now. If a performer went on stage just let's call it a guy, and mm -hmm. went on stage just with another person. Now you got mm -hmm. two guys, or mm -hmm. a guy and a girl. In, mm -hmm. in, in the old days, back in you know the 50s, these kinds of double acts, whether it's Abbott and Costello or Burns and Allen or whomever, these kinds of things were very common. And mm -hmm. now they're not. If you're looking at the long term, not the short term of we got to split you know, the debt money two ways, but in terms of building something that's inherently different, just when you look at it, two people on stage at the same time is already different. Now you've already got a relationship. Now you have a story. Now you've got one person who's trying to do something and another person who's not letting them. Yeah. Which, and let's leave my, let's leave my marriage out of it. But <laughs> my point. But that's funny because that's what, that's what the Red Pack ended up doing in Las Vegas, right? And Dean Martin was doing the jokes. And Sinatra was trying to sing. Yeah, and, and Martin and Lewis, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. Dean, in that case, Dean Martin was the handsome crooner who was trying to sing, and Jerry Lewis was the, the monkey on a string who would not let him. And, you know, and that was there. So you, what you're watching there is you're mm -hmm. watching a relationship. You're not watching right. a, a funny lecture. You're watching a relationship. And that inherently is different. Will it work? Will it make you a star? I don't know, but it'll, I think mm -hmm. it'll do a lot more in, in making you look different and breaking out of the pack. But to an yeah. extent, uh, David Tell and Jeff Ross do that pretty well on oh, stage. Yeah. yeah where yeah, they're like the, kind of roast each other. Yeah. The bumping mics. It's so, it so fun to watch. Yeah. yeah it's incredible. And they switch off too. It's fun when you can switch off now. Like I'm sure back in like the fifties and sixties, like, okay, you're the straight man. You're the funny guy. And now I feel like it can flow more easily. It's more flexible. They can kind of trade off being the straight man and making fun of each other, teaming mm. up together to make fun of someone in the audience. Like the dynamic mm. has so much more flexibility now too. And they can have, have people who are getting more experimental with it. That's yeah. actually very really good. Mm. Absolutely. Well, anyways, everyone, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. This was yeah, awesome. Thank you. I'm sorry thank again you. for being late. Oh, no stress. So no worries. We're right on time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for a very enjoyable morning. Yeah, this is Thank awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.